Okay, well, good afternoon. Welcome to CSIS. My name is Matthew Goodman. I hold the Simon Chair in Political Economy here at CSIS. Uh, I work on Asian economics, um, among other things. Um, and delighted to welcome you here to CSIS on this um, clearing up afternoon, finally. It's a taste of spring in the air. Uh, welcome to our online viewers. We probably have double the number of people in the room uh, watching online. Thank you for joining us as well. Um, let me just, uh, before I introduce Natalie, um, let me um, do some throat clearing here. Uh, first of all, some administrative matters. Uh, if you have phones or noisemakers, please um, silence those. Um, if we have any kind of security event, which is unlikely, but if so, uh, follow me. There's an exit down there to the alley. The rally point is around the corner at National Geographic on M Street. Um, and in terms of the run of show today, um, I'm gonna do a little bit of introductory remarks. Uh, then Natalie and I will have a conversation up here. Uh, and then I'll open the floor to all of you uh, for questions, which Natalie is prepared to take on, I think. Um, and, and then after this, we'll have a reception up on the Sam Nunn Terrace behind us here. Um, there's uh, wine and beer, I think, uh, and hopefully cheese and some nibbles as well. So, um, so this should be a, f oh, and there'll be a book signing as well. There's a table out there where you can uh, buy her book and get her to sign it if, if you'd like that as well. I hope so. Um, okay, so let me introduce this topic by saying that on March 12th, 2015, a date that I remember well, uh, whether it lives in infamy or not. Um, I was walking to lunch and I got an alert on my phone uh, from the Financial Times that a senior administration official in the Obama administration had accused uh, the United Kingdom of constant accommodation of China uh, because, among other things, uh, it had announced that it was going to join the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which was this um, being formed uh, institution that China had um, had announced, uh, and uh, so the I think this was the first time that most people in the United States had heard of this thing or this issue. Um, we had been tracking it at CSIS uh, since, really since uh, Xi Jinping, the president of China, was in uh, Kazakhstan and then uh, Indonesia, I think, in the fall of 2013, um, on his first year as president and he rolled out this new um, set of initiatives uh, where China was going to be um, promoting uh, infrastructure investment across the land uh, mass of Eurasia and also in the maritime belt, uh, uh, sorry, road, uh, maritime Silk Road uh, beneath China. And as part of that announced or mentioned uh, the possibility of setting up a, a bank. Um, and, um, uh, fall of 2014, we actually had Jin Lee Chun, who became the first president of the bank here at CSAS. We heard he was in town on a road show trying to get, among others, the U.S. to consider joining this institution, and he did a round, private roundtable here, and again, most of us learned what the, the real um, plans here were. Uh, it was also the fall of 2014, I think, when, Natalie, when you started getting involved with the AIB, and we're going to talk about that in a second, um, summer of 2015. The charter was agreed and the bank opened on uh, January 1st, 2016. Have I got those dates right, I think? Close. Close enough, all right. Um, close enough. So it's been in operation now for a couple of years and uh, we have a chance now to assess how it's doing with um, somebody who uh, knows more about the founding and the, the setup of the bank than I think anybody, certainly than any American. Um, uh, Natalie Lichtenstein um, was the uh, inaugural general counsel of the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. Uh, prior to that, had been involved in developing the Articles of Agreement and the Charter uh, for the institution. Um, she was a 30-year World Bank official, lawyer uh, in-house at the World Bank. Uh, she had um, also uh, had a background in China and East Asia, both as an undergrad at Harvard and also in your law degree at Harvard, which is impressive. So she's very familiar with uh, this territory, uh, literally and uh, figuratively. <laughs> and uh, so there couldn't have been anybody better to, um, uh, to be involved with this project in China and also to be here today. So we're delighted to have Natalie with us today. Uh, Natalie, let me start with that origin story and, and ask um, how you got pulled into this um, 
into this effort and in 2014, and then sort of the other end of the bookend, you know, why you decided to write this book. Great, thank you very much. And I'm really delighted to be here, and thank you all for coming. So I studied China as an undergraduate at Harvard, and when I came back to my senior year, I um, started looking for jobs, and everyone said, you're 21, you have a BA, you speak Chinese, what else do you do? And I didn't know I was supposed to do anything else, so I went to law school um, because a professor at the law school said, um, you know, with your Chinese, you could do really fabulous things um, with a law degree, and I didn't know to ask what. So I, um, you know, there was, this was 1975, so there were no relations between the two countries, no trade, no nothing. Um, so instead, I went and worked in the U.S. Treasury Department, where, to my surprise, I learned about something called International Financial Institutions and the World Bank. Um, and those two strands didn't meet immediately, but uh, in 1980, when the People's Republic of China was interested in coming back to the World Bank, um, I helped worked on that at Treasury, and then the World Bank Legal Department was looking for a lawyer who spoke Chinese, and I didn't tell them that all of my friends are lawyers who speak Chinese with far better tones than I have. Um, so I went and worked at the World Bank for 30 years, and I worked on about the first 20 years mostly on operations in Asia, um, primarily China, but lots of other countries. I was chief counsel for East Asia. And the last 10 years I worked on governance. I was the institutional lawyer, the, not, not just the what are the powers of the Board of Governors, why can the president do this and the board can't, those kinds of questions, but also reform of the governance. And the last thing I worked on was voice reform, which is enhancing the voice and participation of developing and transition countries in the World Bank group, which meant largely the emerging economies getting a bigger voice. So I had spent about the last 18 months helping to negotiate the package that was agreed in 2010, um, which made China the third largest shareholder if they subscribed to the shares and changed things around in the World Bank. And then I happily retired, which seemed like a good thing to do. Um, so after I retired, a few years later, I heard that the Chinese Ministry of Finance was leading an effort to set up a new multilateral development bank. And they were looking for somebody who knew something about multilateral development banks. And it happened to be the same department I've been working with for 30 years. But during my work on the voice reform, I'd heard about something called the BRICS, the Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa, and that they were going to establish a development bank, which they did, but I'd heard that was going to be in Shanghai, and I thought that would be just great, because I've spent a lot of time visiting Beijing, but not a lot of time visiting Shanghai, so I said, sure. And then I found out there was another bank, so obviously I should have been following CSIS. <laughs> And I would have known what I was getting in for, but that was fine. So uh, that's kind of how I ended up there. And then you were commuting back and forth for right, basically I, two years. Yeah. Um, uh, and then after that, decided to write this book, which, by the way, I haven't uh, held up yet, but uh, Comparative Guide to the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank, which uh, is the book we're talking about today. Um, so you, you decided to write this um, so to when describe I started, your experiences when or I to... started working on the charter, uh, which was the first thing that needed to be negotiated, uh, once, as you said, Xi Jinping announced in 2013 that China was supporting the idea of an Asian infrastructure investment bank. Actually, I discovered in doing some research for the book that the idea had been floating around in Asian financial circles for some time before that, but that really gave it life and momentum. So in October of 2014, China and 21 other countries signed a memorandum of understanding saying we want to establish this bank, we want to finish negotiations, uh, we want to have this charter signed by the end of June, which was you know, eight months later, and the bank operational by the end of 2015. It was a couple weeks late, but right. not bad. So in drafting the charter, I ended up calling up lawyers and Skyping and whatever else with lawyers from other multilateral development banks all over the world. And that was pretty interesting because I asked them, well, what would you change? What would you keep? 
what would you absolutely do differently or do the same? Um, so I got a lot of good ideas from people. But almost all of them said, you remember that book Shahada wrote? So Ibrahim Shahada was the general counsel of the World Bank for about 15 years from 1983 or so. And in 1990, when the most recent multilateral development bank was established, which was the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development, he published a book that was basically a summary of the charter of EBRD and all the other banks. Right. Um, and everyone said, I had that book on my shelf. I used it all the time. So at the end of the process, I thought, well, I've just gone through the same experience and I have a little bit more to add, and I've got some updates to do, so I'll just, that would be a really useful book. Obviously, people thought that was useful. But in addition, for AIB, I found that lots of the things I would read in the paper would write about some new aspect that AIB had um, that must be indicative of China doing something. And I would find myself saying, well, but four other banks do that already. It's not really new. So I thought it would help put what is AIB, what's there, what's not there, that it would be helpful to put it in context. And then you can critique it and say, that's a really lousy idea or that's a great idea. Great. But sort of knowing where it comes from is somewhat helpful. Well, well let's, let's get into that because um, this question of what's new and what isn't new is important. I mean, for, first of all, to say that this, this book is not exactly beach reading. I mean, it's, it's nope. a pretty uh, dense um, book about the, 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 um, the details of the, of the articles in the bank and, 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 and how it operates. But it does, and, and actually you explicitly say, um, I think in your introduction, you say what the reader will not find in here are the ins and outs of the negotiation of the AIB charter, nor an expose of the motivations of those who proposed AIB or joined the effort along the way. Um, uh, but, I mean, you do implicitly talk about what motivated this initiative, um, even if not, you know, the individuals involved and so forth. And um, so, so, so what, you know, why did, why did China want to establish a bank? I mean, what, what was the gap that they were trying to fill. Why was there a need? You just said, you know, what it does is not so different from what you know previous multilateral development banks done. So what was what was needed and what was new about this? So I guess I can offer my speculations since I don't know because right. I never got the hang of asking those follow-up questions um, since 1975. So I think that there are a couple different motivations. There's one level you read about, which is this is a bank that's focused on infrastructure and other productive sectors, but infrastructure connectivity and financing for that in Asia. And I think China saw a gap. I have certainly heard Chinese officials say they felt that infrastructure was really important to their development path and therefore they thought it was important to have a bank that would finance more infrastructure. But and doesn't, the Asian, doesn't there, the Asian Development Bank do statistic, infrastructure? St st statistically, I'm told, there's a huge, was it $8 trillion gap between what the World Bank and ADB had been financing uh, in infrastructure and what might be needed. I can imagine there are many different questions about how you measure that. Mm -hmm. Um, but if it turned out to be half as much, there'd still be a $4 trillion gap. Mm -hmm. So it seems to me that's one of the motivations. And if you think of that as a motivation, then you think, well, many people said, why couldn't China just put more money into the World Bank or into the Asian Development Bank? I learned through my work at the World Bank that these are shareholding institutions like corporations. And so normally, if you put money in, you do that by buying shares. And when you buy shares, you get more voting power. And as I learned through the voice reform exercise at the World Bank, nobody increases their voting power unless somebody else decreases their voting power. And there weren't a lot of takers left when we were done at the World Bank in 2010 who wanted to reduce their voting power. So it was hard for me to imagine that China could put more money in through shareholding in the World Bank, and I think it's a similar story at the ADB. 
And you could say, well, why not put more, give more money to these multilateral institutions and not get voting power for it? And sometimes countries do that. They make big trust funds. They set up facilities kind of outside the bank and with some separate governance structure. But if you look at China's contribution in the end to AIB, it's $30 billion. And to me, even as a lawyer, that's a really big amount of money to put in without having some say about what happens. So then you could say, well, why doesn't China just put that into one of its own banks, say China Development Bank? And I don't know why they didn't do that. But when I look at the motivations for other countries to join or set up multilateral development banks, some of the motivation is you put in one dollar and everybody else puts in three. So you get some leverage. You get some, I would say, cover in the sense that when you do things in developing countries, when you finance projects, it's not just your bilateral issue, it's a multilateral issue. That has pros and cons, but China wouldn't be the first country to decide that that was a good thing to do. They, they also, the Chinese, asserted Jin Li Chun even when he was here uh, back in 2014, and then since then many times in public, has asserted that this bank was going to do things differently and better in some ways. So for example, and it's one of the things you, you know, talk about um, in, in your book, uh, that they weren't going to have this resident board that uh, the World Bank and most of the other MDBs have, where there's a group of 24 uh, representatives, I guess it's 24, uh, roughly. Anyway, some number of people representing uh, countries or groups of countries who sit here, in this case, in the World Bank case, here in Washington, um, and live here and get paid well uh, and live in nice parts of town. Um, and who, who you know, deliberate on the, the, uh, the bank's operations. Um, and that layer, no corporation would have a layer of sort of unelected people in the middle between the actual governors, and in the case of these institutions, the finance ministers and the central bank governors, and the management of the institution itself. And so China said, we're going to strip this out. Right? I'm sorry, I shouldn't be taking away your That's explanation fine. of this, which no, I'm sure is much good. better. But th this. You know, there seems to be a logic to that, but, um, but you know, is that, was that one of the things that was important that was different about this institution? It certainly is different, but it's not unique. Mm -hmm. um, if you only looked at the World Bank and ADB as your world, you would think it was unique. Um, but in fact, the idea, first the idea is what should the board do? So there are two boards, really. There's, as you say, the Board of Governors, which is the shareholders. In the case of the World Bank, that's now 189. In the case of AIB, it's now approved to be about 84, and I understand it will go up. Um, ADB is 67, I think. So that's not exactly a decision-making forum. You can take votes, but you can't really have discussions. Each of them has a board of directors, which each director represents one or more of those governors and they meet more often. In the case of the World Bank and ADB, they're resident in Washington and Manila. And those directors, they're 25 in Washington now, thanks to my reforms. 25. <laughs> they added a sub-Saharan African chair, yeah. so there are three African chairs now. Um, there are 12, I think, in Manila. So that's a more effective group, but 25 is still pretty big. AIB has 12. Um, but the question to me was always not where do they sit, but what do they do? And one of the things I had done was to work with the high-level commission on reforming World Bank Group governance headed by Ernesto Zedillo in 2008 and 2009, which looked very hard at the resident board question from a number of perspectives. One was what should the role of the board be? Should it be approving every operation and then not being able to hold the management accountable for it because they had approved it? Do they really have the skill set, if directors are political representatives of your members, to make those decisions and find the problems in projects because there are certainly problems in projects? Um, and do they have enough time for their strategic role? 
and their oversight role and their policy role. So all of those questions were floating around. I discovered when I went into some of this for the book, not before I had finished doing the charter, that in fact, even for the World Bank, the question of whether the board would be resident or non-resident was not decided in 1944 in Bretton Woods. It wasn't finally decided until the first meeting of the Board of Governors in 1946, where John Maynard Keynes argued for the UK that the IMF and the World Bank should have had a non-resident board. He thought you would have more senior people, they would be more focused on strategic issues, and you would save money. Um, but the US wanted a resident board, and the US won out in that debate. When I looked at the other multilateral development banks, all of them, except maybe IDB, I didn't see anything, considered having a non-resident board, usually for cost savings and for speeding up the processing. Um, and it's really even E8. So of those, the European Investment Bank, which is an entirely European institution but lends worldwide and I think has a bigger book than the other ones, EIB has had a non-resident board since it started in 1957. Granted, it started with six almost contiguous countries in Europe in 1957, but still, they have a non-resident board. EFAD, International Fund for Agricultural and Development, has a non-resident board. There are a number of sub-regional development banks. So it's something where you can look at experience. Mm -hmm. The AIB charter recognizes that. It says it's a non-resident board. It's explicit about the powers of the, of the board in terms of policy, in terms of approving operations, and in terms of oversight and supervision of the bank. So those are some of the things that are different. Okay, well there's a lot more to ask about that, but let me, the other thing that Jin Lee Chun also um, says, actually I don't hear him say it as much now, but he again said it when he was here and he said it publicly a number of times, was that this bank was going to be lean, clean, and green, not mean, right? That was not one of the lists. Lean, clean, and green. Lean meaning efficient, uh, clean meaning not corrupt or not enabling corruption, um, and green obviously meaning it would be uh, lending on an environmentally sustainable basis, I guess. Uh, is that what that, those three words mean? And what, what do they mean? And what, have, what did you do to ensure that those, uh, those things would differentiate this bank from, from others? Um, so I think on the lean side, part of it is, is the structure is still pretty lean. And I think there's still a desire to have decision making be efficient. There are fewer layers than in the other institutions. And so it's a little quicker to make decisions at least in the six months where I was actually, we were actually operating when I was there, that certainly was the case. Um, I, I temper that with the sense that everybody else started small too, so remains to be seen, certainly in terms of financial and the way the place is run and the way salaries are, are set, that kind of thing, I think is lean. On the clean side, AIB has a policy on prohibited practices that's drawn very closely from the anti-corruption policies of the other MDBs that have signed on to this uh, agreement on uh, multi mutual debarment, which basically looks for and sanctions companies that enter into fraudulent or other corrupt practices in bank finance projects or in bank finance procurement. In other words, you buy computers for the headquarters. Um, make sure nobody gets a bribe for which, you know, which, which kind of computers you buy kind of thing. So those are all pretty together. I think they're as good as the others. You can critique all of them. And on green, while the energy strategy was decided after I left, certainly the environmental and social framework at AIB is pretty compatible with the environmental and social policy requirements at the World Bank and the ADB. If you've looked at the AIB projects to date, I think they're 26. I think about two thirds of them are co-financed, mostly with the World Bank or ADB or the European Bank, or EIB, or there are a few with the Asian Development Bank, private sector a lot with IFC. Those couldn't be co-financed if the policies weren't compatible. So it, it's, I think there's a good start. There are always gonna be challenges. 
But that last point raises the question of whether there is a tension here between, I mean, if they're going to do something different, they're going to do things faster, more efficiently, um, but they're also going to go through those, um, you know, those ensuring you know, that the environmental reviews have been done and that, that all the due diligence has been done around um, uh, the lending, that, uh, you know, that it might end up that you know this is not operating all that differently from you know from any of the other existing banks it might um, but i think at the beginning you have the advantage of starting from scratch in in some sense i mean you have this tension as you say between doing something differently because otherwise why do you need this bank other than money and doing something similar for a lot of reasons why do you want to be similar in the first place well first if you want credibility for a brand new financial institution, the more you can say, here's how I look like the others and here's where I'm different, markets can evaluate you. They've got AAA ratings from all three mark, you know, rating agencies. Governments can explain to their parliaments why they should become members. And recipient countries, client countries, can say, yeah, okay, I understand what they do. They make loans, they have, they have guarantees, they do equity investments. They do them a little differently, but they're not completely reinventing the wheel and causing me to reinvent the wheel. They're providing me an option that I'm familiar with. Maybe they fix some of the things I always complained about. Um, so I think there's some reasons for, the credit, for looking like the others. But I do think that even in setting those policies and in comparing ad nauseum all of the others, it's very hard in existing institutions to make changes because there are vested interests, not in a bad way necessarily, but parties are used to doing things the same way. And if you want to do it differently, you have to explain that. And somebody's not going to like the change. So you do have an opportunity to update policies, to make some of those, they're still hard decisions, but to do those at the beginning when there aren't as many vested interests. Um, eventually, it'll be harder to change these policies, mm -hmm. but it was easier to do them at the beginning. Okay, I, I wanna ask a couple more, sort of slightly more delicate questions that are on people's minds, I think, um, uh, one of which relates to the relationship of the bank to China itself. Um, again, there's a lot of, I think, misunderstanding about this or lack of understanding, not necessarily misunderstanding about exactly what that relationship is. There's, frankly, I think some suspicion here. And in fact, in your book, um, you know, first of all, you note that the AIB has signed an MOU with China um, under the Belt and Road Initiative, China's broader initiative to promote infrastructure investment um, and other connectivity across the, um, the world. Um, you say that, you know, the AIB charter says the president, officers, and staff, quote, owe their duty entirely to the bank and no other authority. But Jin Li Chun is a member of the Communist Party of China, and, um, uh, you know, he lives and works in Beijing, and, you know, question whether, I mean, that's one of the things that I think people are asking about. Um, Jin Li Chun himself, in the foreword to your book, um, alludes to the Silk Road and, his uh, vision of um, the Silk Road, and he, he uh, applauds Xi Jinping for planting the seed for, um, for this initiative. Um, and so, you know, I think these kinds of questions raise questions in people's minds about whether this is a Chinese, uh, something to advance Chinese interests or something to uh, provide broader uh, economic and possibly other benefits to, you know, to, the, to the Asia region as a whole. How do you answer that? I guess I would say first, I think any country, any member should be joining these institutions because it's in their national interest. I mean, I'm a citizen of the United States. I would expect that the United States participates in international organizations because it's in our interest to do so. Maybe so, including this one. I'm, that's my next question, but well, I'll we'll come to that there. in a second. Well, we'll I'm not sure. I, we'll come back in, to that. We'll come yeah. back to that. So that's my first question, my first thought. In terms of the language about the uh, president, the bank and its officers shall, um, you know, owe their duty only to the bank and shall 
take only economic considerations into account and shall not interfere in the domestic political affairs of a member. Actually, that language appears in all of the charters, with some exception for the European Bank because its motive is political, so they had to play around with it. But that language has been hanging around since 1944 in Bretton Woods, New Hampshire. So for me, when I heard that some countries had concerns while we were negotiating this about whether they should join the negotiations, and people said to me, well, there'll probably be a Chinese head of this institution. China's going to be the largest shareholder, and it's going to be in Beijing. Isn't that a problem? And I said, yes. I lived there for 30 years. It's called the World Bank. And it has good parts and bad parts. It means somebody's on the hook for you, which is something we hear a lot in Washington. If something goes wrong with this, you're really, it's, it's on you first, even though you're only a shareholder. The US was way more than 25% shareholder when IBRD started. Um, so I think that all of them have the same goals in that sense. But China does not have a lot of experience with international organizations headquartered in China. Uh, so I think there will be maybe some learning curve. I think there's a learning curve for the New York City Police Department every fall when there's the General Assembly <laughs> in New York and you find out where the intersection is between headquarters agreements and local law. But also on the Belt and Road Initiative, which just to say a word on that, I think that the memorandum AIB signed, and I have not seen it because it's not public, was something that the Ministry of Finance um, agreed with six, of China, of China mm -hmm. agreed with six or seven MDBs, including World Bank and AIB and a few others. Um, so I think they all signed on to cooperating on Belt and Road. I never heard very much about Belt and Road when we were negotiating or discussing this. Uh, it was not, in, it's not embedded in the charter, it's not part of this, but as your Reconnecting Asia initiative shows anybody who wants to look, there's an, over, an, in, oversect, an intersection of projects and activities between Belt and Road and AIB, so they are factually connected. Thank you for doing something that I should have shamelessly done before, which was to market our Reconnecting Asia site. And actually, if you can put the other slide up there, we'll yeah. get the URL uh, and, the, and our pretty map up there. So please do check out our, our site if you're not already familiar with it. It's got you know, a great database of about 2,300 projects, not all Belt and Road or AIV. There are lots of um, other um, initiatives covered in there. Um, you know, you do, though, and you just alluded to it in the US context in the World Bank, but you, know, you do talk on page 201, <laughs> about the importance of hegemonic politics in shaping past MDBs. Um, and, you know, so that, you know, does, um, again, raise the question about China's role in driving this. But, but let me just ask in a more specific way. I mean, you said, as you just mentioned, China has a 25% um, voting share. Um, does that give it veto power and is there, is, are there checks and balances? What kinds of checks and balances did you incorporate to make sure that nobody, especially China, has undue weight in the institution? So the, the question of what's a v veto power in these banks is also a very interesting question. It's not like the UN where the names of the countries are written into the charter. In all of these multilateral development banks, by and large, the voting majorities are by numbers. So it's a percentage of voting power. And for really important decisions, it's both a number of countries and a percentage of voting power. So if you read, as you could have read this morning, that the US has a, has a veto in the World Bank, it's true. There's one decision in the World Bank that requires an 85% majority, and I can't remember whether it's two-thirds or three-fourths of the countries. And the United States has more than 15% of the vote. 17 or so, right? 16, whatever. So the US has a veto on one thing, amendments of the charter. But if you read, you'll think they have a veto on everything. In the IMF, there are about 10 decisions or so. In the other banks, 
there are a set of decisions that are require two thirds of the members and 75% of the vote. And that's the model that we took for AIB. So it's very similar in its voting majorities in the numbers to the European Bank, in some cases to the ADB, the IADB. They, they have very similar sort of, there are a couple of exceptions that might be higher, but usually it's about 75%. And AIB has some of the same decisions. And then we have some more decisions that we put to the board because we also built some flexibility into this charter to say if you want to lend to non-members or have activities in non-members, if you want to change this sh threshold, if you want to change that, go to the Board of Governors, get two-thirds of the countries, get 75% of the vote, and do it. And don't sort of find a way to finesse this under the existing charter. Make, make a concrete decision that this is something that's good to do. So right now China has 26% and so any of those decisions, um, amending the articles, increasing the capital, China can veto. But they can't push anything through because they still need the rest of the, the shareholding and non-regionals have about 25% and regionals have 75% with some variation. So China's about 26, India's between seven and eight, Russia's between six and seven. Um, then you have Korea, Indonesia, Germany, Australia, Saudi Arabia. So a lot of different countries from different places that are then in the next kind of group. UK and France are about 3%, Germany's about 4%. Okay, um, just two more questions, then I'll let the audience uh, come in. So that list you just read out of countries did not include two names, two countries in particular, uh, the United States and Japan. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the beginning, and I guess I didn't finish the story, but you know, when this FT story blew up um, and a lot of other countries rushed into the bank, uh, there were stories, and even maybe in that story, um, a, a uh, an interpretation that the U.S. had been trying to stop countries from joining. It had a number of concerns. There, there are different theories on that. Um, I'm not sure it was quite so much that the U.S. was trying to stop people. It was just it had questions about the institution um, and a separate problem with the U.K., which is why that particular person uh, said what they said about the U.K. and China. Um, but, but the U.S. did have reservations. The U.S. also had reservations about the Inter-American Development Bank, about the Asian Development Bank, about the European Bank for Reconstruction and Development historically. So this is not the first time. Um, is, I guess, first of all, you know, what do you think the U.S. is worried about when these things are set up? And, and what do you think might change a U.S. posture towards specifically the AIB? The two things that I've seen are concerns about governance and concerns about standards. If the concerns about governance are that China will be the largest shareholder, that's probably not going to change anytime soon. There's no reason it couldn't someday change. It's not embedded in the charter, but I think it's highly unlikely if that's the governance concern. If the governance concern is the U.S. has always wanted to be the largest shareholder, it's not 100% true in the African bank, but in the other banks, yes, the U.S. has been the largest shareholder. They don't, U.S. policy is we don't want to join an institution where we're not the largest shareholder. That could be a continuing concern. I don't know that that should be or is. Um, if the U.S. has a concern with a non-resident board, I think that's not likely to change. If they have concerns with the standards, though, I think the fact that the standards are maybe updated but still compatible in terms of project standards with the other multilateral development banks, I think that is probably should be less of a concern. The, and standards, the, just for the general audience like me, means <laughs> social and environmental safeguards and procurement practices. And economic um, and procurement and technical and audits and disbursement and are you, is everything done in accordance with sort of international expectations in terms of what, how your money is being used and how the projects, if there are projects, are being constructed. Mm -hmm. 
But what I think hasn't changed is the likelihood that there would be congressional action to approve the U.S. doing this and to appropriate money for it. Um, but that too could change. I mean, I'm not. I'm but not. But I a wouldn't hold my breath. I'm not a Congress um, watcher. Right. I think, to me, the more interesting question is Japan, mm -hmm. because I think that it's not clear to me what the U.S., how deep the U.S. interest would be, but I think if this is going to be a major player in Asia, and remains to be seen, but if it is, I think Japan is a major part of Asia. And there, I think the negotiation is more with all the other countries than a little bit with China, um, you know, because nobody goes up but no, somebody else goes down in shareholding, if Japan comes in with anything like its economic weight, it would be a large shareholder. And China would have to go down, but so would India and Russia and Korea and Australia and Germany and France and the UK and Saudi Arabia and Indonesia. So some of those might like it and some of those might not. Um, it would be fun to negotiate. I mean, there is an active debate in Japan about this and very strong views on, on both sides. Um, and, uh, you know, I'm not expecting Japan to change its view anytime soon, but you, as you say, there is a certain logic and that may happen someday. Um, okay, final question. You only had one paragraph at the very end of your book called The AIB's Future. Um, and so I'm going to push you to speculate a little bit more about, you know, than you did in that paragraph about where you think it's headed. What are the biggest opportunities, the biggest risks and challenges um, for the bank? That's a big question, but you know, if you can give me anything uh, that looks well, forward. I th to me, if I looked for themes, I would say if I had spent as much effort as the Chinese government did in getting a community together to set this up, I would want it to work well. And for it to work well, it needs to work like a multilateral institution. And it needs to make decisions on economic grounds and not political grounds. And it needs to do good technical work and they need to hire good people. And they need to maintain their credibility. And it doesn't mean that there won't be problem projects and problem loans. That happens everywhere. The interesting question will be how does AIB deal with them? And so far, they seem to be pretty much following kind of a multilateral playbook. But I also think two years is actually kind of short, even though it feels really long. So and time will tell. Time will tell. And you know, when I look at the history of the other banks, and I looked in a cursory fashion, it was very interesting to see the unexpected. You look at IDB, which as you said, the Inter-American Development Bank, the U.S. was reluctant to come in initially. Why did you need another bank? Why wasn't the World Bank covering what the regional folks needed? And the U.S. came in at about 42% of the funding. But there came a time in U.S. domestic, economic, and foreign policy in the late 60s when the U.S. was not going to put more money in and the bank needed more money and they went through significant surgery to take in non-regionals, which is to say to take in Europeans and Japan at that point because they needed the money. Nobody ever thought that was coming, I think. So I'm not saying, and that will happen to AIB tomorrow, but especially having been in the World Bank through the, the financial crisis of the late 90s and the financial crisis of 2008, stuff you never expected will happen. And it's more how will they deal with that. So, you know, I don't, think, I don't think I know what it'll look like. I just hope they'll keep making good decisions. Okay, great. I have lots more, but I want to give the audience a little chance here to, uh, to, to jump in. I know there are smart people in this room who know a lot more about this subject matter than I do, so I will and let I, you um, wait, if you could, for the microphone, uh, identify yourself, and please ask a brief question. Gentleman in the front row. Hi, I'm Chen Wei from China Daily. Thank you for the wonderful talk. I would just uh, continue on previous. I mean, the Obama administration narrative is, you know, questioning 
the governance, transparency, you know, of AIB. That's why, you know, we want to prevent others to join, or it, why U.S. doesn't join. Obviously, you answer the most of the question. But the other narrative is China wants to set up its own institution to challenge the global norms, the existing system. I don't know, what's your answer to that? I mean, is, is that a geopolitics? I mean, you didn't touch on, is the real reason why Obama administration you know, it, uh, opposed to the AIB. If that's the case, do you think uh, U.S. will join under the Trump administration? Or, you know, uh, if that geopolitics, I mean, it's getting worse, obviously, between the two countries, if you look at uh, the national security strategy. Thank you. Okay. Good luck. Thank you. I, I still think that one of the major factors is what the political views in the U.S. will be on the Hill and in terms of legislation, in terms of U.S. participation. If the administration wanted to join the institution, I suppose they would have fine support. But I don't think I see a lot of evidence for the narrative that China wanted to set up its own norms. Because as we've discussed, the norms in AIB are not radically different from the norms in other institutions. And there are incentives for AIB to have similar institutions and similar norms in order to be a participant in this, in, in this world, in this world of multilateral development banks. I also really have no information myself about why the US administration took the views it did. I've seen a statement by President Obama from uh, the Rose Garden in April of 2015 mm -hmm. saying that simply not true that the U.S. opposed or opposed others joining. I've also read articles that suggest that, you know, major U.S. allies in, uh, in Asia in particular were lobbied. So I think that's not something I know the facts or maybe anybody knows the facts, but I, I don't, doesn't make much difference to me. I don't, when it's in the U.S. interest, I'm sure the U.S. will find a way. I think it would be good for AIB, but it's hardly essential. Okay, thank you. Gentleman there. Friend. Yeah. Martin Christney with KPMG. Um, basically, the multilateral banks are financial institutions that lend and provide uh, grants and other sorts of services to their members. I wonder what consideration was given to innovations in the kinds of instruments that were used at AIIB. Um, we see guarantees and loans are principally at the World Bank and equity is done at the IFC, and I see at the AIIB you have both of those housed in the same organization. Um, so was there consideration given to developing new instruments or new approaches? And further, one of the limits of many MDBs is their risk appetite. And so having to have a AAA rating limits what they can do on their balance sheets and on their assets. So I'm wondering if there's any consideration to not putting that, or if that is in the charter, and if it isn't, is there any consideration to having a different credit rating for the institution? Okay. Well, in terms of the instruments, uh, actually, after the World Bank and IFC, IFC was founded in, I think, um, 56, mm -hmm. the other multilateral banks actually have combined loans, equity, and non-government guarantee operations, and eventually equity um, into the same institution. So that, again, I, I hate to say is not novel. What is novel in the AIB charter is that there's a provision that says, and other types of financing decided by the Board of Governors. In part because I could imagine that my uh, financial colleagues could come up with new types of instruments, and rather than trying to justify them as looking like a loan or a guarantee or an equity, rather say, put this up to the Board of Governors, say why it is, it is a good thing for the institution to do, why it's good for the clients, and do it in an optimal way and not in a way that fits necessarily within the definitions of loans, guarantees, and, and equity. So that has not been difficult. The, the AAA rating is not in anybody's charter. Um, what is in the charter is a, an underlying lending limit, which I don't think gets anywhere near, you know, what the complex set of factors that they look at for a rating. But in most of them, many of them, it's a one-to-one -one ratio. You can't lend more than your subscribed unimpaired capital and your reserves. 
AIB has that and has the potential to go up to 250%, 2.5 times, which is the same as the European Investment Bank and a couple other banks. But I think actually how you calculate the ratios is probably more important um, to the use of capital, which is what part of what you're getting at, I think. Okay, I understood 40% of that. <laughs> um, no, no, I the tried. gentleman, no, you did, you did great. Um, the gentleman in the back there, yeah. Thank you for the great discussion. I'm Nakashima from the Japan Bank for International Cooperation. I have one question about the uh, um, AIIB's um, lending guidelines. As you mentioned, the AIIB's guidelines is almost the same as the World Bank or ADB, those other MDBs. And uh, I also found this website, the AIIB, is, uh, its uh, guidelines are almost the same. But I, I remember that the last autumn, when the IMF World Bank, World Bank annual meeting was held in Washington, D.C. The President Jim of the AIIB came to Washington and he made a presentation that the, I don't recall the exact wording, but he mentioned that the guidelines and norms which is applied, which should be applied to the developing countries is not necessarily the same as the guidelines which was established by the Western countries. So I think that I understand he has the same kind of guidelines, but he wants to apply another understanding of uh, existing very strict guidelines um, established by the World Bank or Western MDBs. Do you think that the AIB is going to have the uh, kind of the uh, another understanding or more loose um, appliance of the lending guidelines? I'm somewhat puzzled by the question. I certainly did not hear the discussion by President Jin Lee Chun, nor have I been working in AIB for the last two years. But if you mean by lending guidelines, there are policies and procedures that are legally required for all operations. Uh, indeed, there is a statement in the charter that's in none of the other charters that says every operation has to meet the operational policies and procedures. But I don't think that those are applied in some different way. There may be other decisions that you're referring to that I don't know about in terms of looking at countries differently. Uh, but in terms of the lending policies and procedures, I don't see a lot of room. Thank you. Okay, over here, yes ma'am, in the front row here. Um, thank you, Senator Dornsife from Johns Hopkins SICE. Thank you, Natalie. Thank you, Matthew and CSAS. I forgot to mention that Natalie is an adjunct professor at SICE. Yes, um, right. Go SICE. Um, so, um, Natalie, I agree with you that two years is really not a very long time to really interpret what is the way of the future. But maybe if you could take a look at those 26 lending operations, most of them are co financed with existing institutions. But for those that are not, is there any theme that you see that would give us a little bit of a glimpse into the future? And then secondly, related to this question from a um, colleague from JBIC, is that I also heard Lee Kun Jin talking about how infrastructure could mean also social infrastructure. And I'm wondering, have you heard that? Have others heard that? Maybe just those are my questions. Um, I haven't looked at the project level of details. One of the beautiful things about no longer being the lawyer is I don't have to. <laughs> but I trust that my successors have done a fabulous job. So I can't comment on, I mean, I haven't looked at them for themes. I think we are tracking them in Reconnecting Asia, or at least we're, we have a, a database of all the AIB projects we're aware of, and, and most of those are co-financed, and we could probably Well, at least it's two-thirds. There are about, so right, that so means there's are seven or eight that are, right, that are not, enough. and I haven't looked to see where they are and, and what they are. I mean, my sense from many multi, being in multilateral development bank lending for a long time is you can also have projects that essentially are follow-on projects. If you're the financier and something works in provinces one, two, and three, you might two years later do a similar project in three, four, and five. If somebody else does that, it's not a co-finance project, but it's a very similar project. Some of what AIB 
I know at least the projects in Oman must have been very different because nobody else is lending to Oman. Um, so, you know, I think that's fair. In terms of infrastructure, I think Social. the definitions are quite broad everywhere. Uh, you know, EBRD invests in hospitals too. So what, what the definition is of infrastructure, there isn't a definition. Uh, and AIB is able to lend in infrastructure and other productive sectors. And if you've heard Jin Lee Chun, he has probably said other productive sectors means other productive sectors. And if I were still his lawyer, I would say that's the right thing to say. <laughs> A, the World Bank has this term productive sectors in it, in the charter, about five times, productive purposes, productive sectors. And it's been a key feature of interpretations. It came from, in 1944, from a desire to keep away from some of the lending and the loans that had been defaulted in the 30s, which had been for armaments, for budget, and for things that weren't considered productive. How that will play in 10 years from now, I don't know. But I, you know, some of us made a living interpreting the IBRD charter, whose purposes are yo long. Um, and I wouldn't want to take that away from anybody at AIB. All right. Uh, yes, sir. In the, and maybe I'll take three and then the, the last three. The gentleman over there and Peter. Yeah, thank you. I'm Mark Tokola with the Korea Economic Institute. And my question is, uh, if international sanctions were eased on North Korea, is there a way that the AIIB could be involved in infrastructure investment in North Korea? Okay, let's hold that North Korea yeah. question. Peter, since he's right there, can you just hand the microphone forward? Thank you, Peter Bottelier. No current affiliation. I used to <laughs> teach at Johns Hopkins size. Uh, question on membership. I understand from your book that to become an AIIB member, you have to be a member of the World Bank and or the Asian Development Bank. Taiwan is a member of the Asian Development Bank and used to be a member of the World Bank. Why is Taiwan not on the membership list? Good, so we got a good North Korea-Taiwan uh, pairing over here and then back here. The last question. Joe Henning with Mansfield Society. You had mentioned that the U.S. might find a way to join the bank if it, if it was in its national interest. Uh, you also mentioned the bank didn't require the U.S.'s participation. Uh, could I invite you to speculate about how China would receive uh, an overture from the U.S. If it, if it later decided it was in its national interest to pursue membership? Okay, so all the sort of outlier cases here. We have North Korea, <laughs> Taiwan, and the United States. Uh, you can handle them all as yeah. once or maybe differentiate well, among the three. For North Korea, it's not a member of ADB and it's not a member of IBRD. It could become a member of either one be a member of IBRD, they'd have to become a member of the IMF, the International Monetary Fund, first. But there is a provision in the AIB charter that permits AIB to provide assistance to non-members. Again, you have to take it to the Board of Governors. You have to make sure you get a really high majority. It has to be in the interest of the institution. Why is that there? Because in the World Bank, the charter says the use of resources and facilities shall be exclusively for the benefit of members. So when the World Bank wanted to provide support, as it still does, to West Bank Gaza, which is not a member, or to entities before they became members, such as East Timor, before it was timor Leste, there were lots of hoops to be jumped through to make it possible for the bank to take on these activities. So one of the reasons it's in the AIB charter is it would be possible for AIB, if the members decided so, to provide assistance to a non-member. The reason why it says what kind of assistance is because you wouldn't want, I think, to make loans most of the time to a non-member entity. You wouldn't have the same kind of legal protections. You wouldn't have the same structure. Most of what the World Bank has done with non-members, if not all, has been in the form of grants. So somebody puts in money for a trust fund and you administer the trust fund. And certainly if there were a day when there were activities in North Korea, it would be possible for AIB to do that. It would also be possible for the World Bank. Historically, the United States has not wanted that to happen. Um, but we're talking about a world in which many things will have changed. 
As far as membership in AIB <coughs> is concerned, as you know, um, you need to be an entity that is either a member of the International Bank for Reconstruction and Development, the World Bank, IBRD, or the Asian Development Bank. There were three members of the Asian Development Bank that were not members of IBRD when we negotiated this. I think that's still true. One is the Cook Islands. Their membership in AIB was approved <coughs> in December. One is Hong Kong, China. Their membership in AIB was approved last March. They became members of AIB last June. And the third, in terms of Asian Development Bank membership, is Taipei Kamino Space China, um, which is what the Republic of China is referred to in the ADB. And they could certainly apply for membership in the, IBRD, in, in the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. And as far as I know, they haven't, but I've been gone for two years, so I would not know. Um, and, uh, you know, that's possible. As far as the U.S. joining AIB, you know, I, I don't know what China's view would be, but until now, every time, everything I've heard them say has been, at least to hear Jin Li Chun say, has been, we would welcome that. Uh, I haven't heard anything recently from the Ministry of Finance, and I would assume that President Jin is speaking for AIB. Okay, uh, great, uh, fantastic. I'm sure there are more questions. You may have an opportunity if you buy the book uh, to <laughs> chat with uh, Natalie um, out there and there will be drinks up on the uh, terrace. But let me just say, this is really an important book and I think um, a very great resource. And I think uh, it is not beach reading, but it is interesting. Keep and, it on and, your shelf. And it is You'll worth having it. as a reference material. And so I would encourage you to, to buy it and, and read it. Um, but. We really thank you, Natalie, for coming. Uh, thank you, and thank please you join me in, in having uh, in, in her participation. Thanks so much. Thank you.